carpenters glanced up, and the soldiers, who had guided Kaladin, dashed back toward the center of camp. The slaves behind Kaladin looked around anxiously. Stormfather! Bridgman! Up, up, you louts! The men scattered their bowls, scrambling to their feet. They wore simple sandals instead of proper boots. You, Lordship! I didn't say... I don't care what in damnation you said. You're in Bridge 4! Gaz pointed at a group of departing bridgemen. The rest of you, go wait over there. I'll divide you up later. Get moving or I'll see you strung up by your heels. <laughs> Kaladin shrugged and jogged after the group of bridgemen. It was one of many teams of such men pouring out of barracks or picking themselves up out of alleys. There seemed to be quite a lot of them. Around 50 barracks with perhaps 20 or 30 men in each. That would make nearly as many bridgemen in this army as there had been soldiers in Emeron's entire force. Kaladin's team crossed the grounds, weaving between boards and paws of sawdust, approaching a large wooden contraption. It had obviously weathered a few high storms and some battles. The dents and holes scattered along its length looked like places where arrows had struck. The bridge in Bridgeman, perhaps? It was a wooden bridge, about 30 feet long, 8 feet wide. It sloped down at the front and back and had no railings. The wood was thick, with the largest boards for support through the center. There were some 40 or 50 bridges lined up here. Perhaps one for each barrack, making one crew for each bridge? About 20 bridge crews were gathering at this point. Gaz had found himself a wooden shield and a gleaming mace, but there were none for anyone else. He quickly inspected each team. He stopped beside bridge four and hesitated. Where's your bridge leader? Dead. Tossed himself down the honor chasm last night. Can't you keep your bridge leader for even a week, Stormit? Line up. I'll run near you. Listen for my commands. We'll sort out another bridge leader after we see who survives. Gaz pointed at Kaladin. You're at the back, Lordling. The rest of you get moving. Storm you, I won't suffer another reprimand because of you fools. Move. Move! The others were in position to lift. Kaladin had no choice but to go to the open slot at the tail of the bridge. He'd been a little low in his assessment. Looked like about 35 to 40 men per bridge. There was room for five men across, three under the bridge and one on each side, and eight deep, though this crew didn't have a man for each position. He helped lift the bridge into the air. They were probably using a very light wood for the bridges, but the thing was still storms cursed heavy. Kaladin hoisted the bridge up high and then stepped underneath. Men dashed in to fill the middle slots down the length of the structure. Then, slowly, they all set the bridge down on their shoulders. At least there were rods on the bottom to use as handholds. The other men had pads on the shoulders of their vests to cushion the weight and adjust the height to fit the supports. Kaladin hadn't been given a vest, so the wooden supports dug directly into his skin. He couldn't see a thing. There was an indentation for his head, but wood cut off his view to all sides. The men at the edges had a better view. He suspected those spots were more coveted. The wood smelled of oil and sweat. Go! The crew broke into a jog. He couldn't see where he was going and struggled to keep from tripping as the bridge crew marched down the eastern slope to the shattered plains. Soon, Kaladin was sweating the wood rubbing and digging into the skin on his shoulders. He was already starting to bleed. Poor fool. Kaladin glanced to the right, but the wooden handholds obstructed his view. Are you... are you talking to me? You shouldn't have insulted Gaz. He sometimes lets new men run in an outside row. Sometimes... Kaladin tried to respond, but he was already out of breath. He thought himself in better shape than this, but he'd spent eight months being fed slop, being beaten, and waiting out high storms in leaking cellars, muddy barns, or cages. He was hardly the same man anymore. Breathe in and out deeply. Focus on the steps. Count them. It helps. Kaladin followed the advice. He could hear other bridge crews running nearby. Behind them came the familiar sounds of an army following. Below, rock buds and small shale bark ridges grew from the stone, tripping him. The landscape of the shattered plains appeared to be broken, uneven, and rent, covered with outcroppings and shelves of rock. 
That explained why they didn't use wheels on the bridges. Porters were probably much faster over such rough terrain. Soon, his feet were ragged and battered. Couldn't they have given me shoes? He set his jaw against the agony and kept on going. Just another job. He would continue, and he would survive. His feet fell on wood, a bridge, a permanent one, crossing a chasm between plateaus on the shattered plains. In seconds, the bridge crew was across it, and his feet fell on stone again. Move! Move! Storm you! Keep moving! They continued jogging, and the army crossed the bridge behind them. Before too long, blood ran down Kaladin's shoulders. <sighs> the next hour was torture. It was worse than any beating he'd suffered as a slave, worse than any wound on the battlefield. There seemed to be no end to the march. Kaladin vaguely remembered seeing the permanent bridges back when he'd looked down on the plains from the slave cart. They connected the plateaus where the chasms were easiest to span, not where it would be most efficient for those traveling. That often meant detours north or south before they could continue eastward. They crossed bridge after bridge, plateau after plateau. Kaladin never got a good look at one of the chasms. He just kept running and running. He couldn't feel his feet any longer. He kept running. He knew somehow that if he stopped, he'd be beaten. He felt as if his shoulders had been rubbed to the bone. He tried counting steps, but was too exhausted even for that. But he didn't stop running. Oh! Yeah. Kaladin blinked, stumbling to a stop yeah. and nearly collapsing. Lift! The men lifted, Kaladin's arms straining at the motion after so much time holding the bridge in one place. Rock! They stepped aside, the bridgemen underneath taking handholds at the sides. It was awkward and difficult, but these men had practice, apparently. They kept the bridge from toppling as they set it on the ground. Push! Kaladin stumbled back in confusion as the men pushed at their handholds on the side or back of the bridge. They were at the edge of a chasm lacking a permanent bridge. To the sides, the other bridge crews were pushing their own bridges forward. Kaladin glanced over his shoulder. The army was 2,000 men in forest green and pure white. 1,200 dark-eyed spearmen, several hundred cavalry atop rare precious horses. Behind them, a large group of heavy foot, light-eyed men in thick armor and carrying large maces and square steel shields. It seemed that they'd intentionally chosen a point where the chasm was narrow and the first plateau was a little higher than the second. The bridge was twice as long as the chasm's width here. Kaladin joined the others, shoving the bridge across the rough ground. When the bridge was in place on the other side of the chasm, the bridge crew drew back to let the cavalry trot across. Kaladin was too exhausted to watch. He collapsed to the stones and lay back. He rolled his head to the side. The other bridgemen had lain down as well. Gaz walked among the various crews, shaking his head. Kaladin longed to lie there, staring at the sky, oblivious of the world. His training, however, warned that might cause him to cramp. That would make the return trip even worse. That training, it belonged to another man from another time. Almost from the shadow days. But while Kaladin might not be him any longer, he could still heed him. And so Kaladin forced himself to sit up and begin rubbing his muscles. Soldiers crossed the bridge for a cross, spears held high, shields forward. Gaz watched them with obvious envy, and Kaladin's windspring danced around the man's head. Despite his fatigue, Kaladin felt a moment of jealousy. Why was she bothering that blowhard instead of Kaladin? After a few minutes, Gaz noticed Kaladin and scowled at him. He's wondering why you aren't lying down. The man who had been running beside Kaladin lay on the ground a short distance away, staring up at the sky. He was older, with graying hair, and he had a long, leathery face. He looked as exhausted as Kaladin felt. Kaladin kept rubbing his legs, pointedly ignoring Gaz. 
Then he ripped off some portions of his sack-like clothing and bound his feet and shoulders. Fortunately, he was accustomed to walking barefoot as a slave, so the damage wasn't too bad. As he finished, the last of the foot soldiers passed over the bridge. They were followed by several mounted light eyes in gleaming armor. At their center rode a man in majestic burnished red shard plate. It was distinct from the one other Kaladin had seen. Each suit was said to be an individual work of art, but it had the same feel. Ornate, interlocking, topped by a beautiful helm with an open visor. The armor felt alien somehow. It had been crafted in another epoch, a time when gods had wrought Roshar. Is that the king? <laughs> we could only wish. Kaladin turned toward him, frowning. If that were the king, then that would mean we were in Bright Lord Dalinar's army. He's a high prince, right? The king's uncle? Aye. The best of men. The most honorable shard bearer in the king's army. They say he's never broken his word. <laughs> Much the same had been said about Amaram. You should wish to be in High Prince Dalinar's force, lad. He doesn't use bridge crews. Not like these, at least. All right, you Kremlings! On your feet! The bridgemen stumbled upright. The brief rest had been just enough to show how exhausted he was. I'll be glad to get back. Back? We aren't turning around? <laughs> Lad, we aren't nearly there yet. Be glad we aren't. Arriving is the worst part. And so the nightmare began its second phase. They crossed the bridge, pulled it over behind them, then lifted it up on sore shoulders once more. They jogged across the plateau. On the other side, they lowered the bridge again to span another chasm. The army crossed, then it was back to carrying the bridge again. They repeated this a good dozen times. They did get to rest between carries, but Kaladin was so sore and overworked that the brief respites weren't enough. He barely caught his breath each time before being forced to pick up the bridge again. They were expected to be quick about it. The bridgemen got to rest while the army crossed, but they had to make up the time by jogging across the plateaus, passing the ranks of soldiers so that they could arrive at the next chasm before the army. At one point, his leathery-faced friend warned him that if they didn't have their bridge in place quickly enough, they'd be punished with whippings when they returned to camp. Gaz gave orders, cursing the bridgemen, kicking them when they moved too slowly, never doing any real work. It didn't take long for Kaladin to nurture a seething hatred of the scrawny, scar-faced man. That was odd. He hadn't felt hatred for his other sergeants. It was their job to curse at the man and keep them motivated. That wasn't what burned Kaladin. Gaz had sent him on this trip without sandals or a vest. Despite his bandages, Kaladin would bear scars from his work this day. He'd be so bruised and stiff in the morning that he'd be unable to walk. What Gaz had done was the mark of a petty bully. He risked the mission by losing a carrier, all because of a hasty grudge. Kaladin used his hatred of Gaz to sustain him through the ordeal. Several times after pushing the bridge into place, Kaladin collapsed, feeling sure he'd never be able to stand again. But when Gaz called for them to rise, Kaladin somehow struggled to his feet. It was either that, or let Gaz win. Why were they going through all of this? What was the point? Why were they running so much? They had to protect their bridge, the precious weight, the cargo. They had to hold up the sky and run. They had to... He was growing delirious, feet running. One, two, one, two, one, two. Oh! He stopped. Left. He raised his hands up. He stepped back, then lowered the bridge. He pushed the bridge. Die. The last command, he added each time. They fell back to the stone, a rock bud hastily withdrawing its vines as he touched them. He closed his eyes, no longer able to care about cramps. He entered a trance, a kind of half-sleep for what seemed like one heartbeat. Run! He stood, stumbling on bloody feet. Cross! He crossed, not bothering to look at the deadly drop on either side. Pull! He grabbed a handhold and pulled the bridge across the chasm after him. Switch! 
Kaladin didn't understand that command. Gaz had never given it before. The troops were forming ranks, moving with that mixture of skittishness and forced relaxation that men often went through before a battle. A few anticipation spread, like red streamers growing from the ground and whipping in the wind, began to sprout from the rock and wave among the soldiers. A battle? Gaz grabbed Kaladin's shoulder and shoved him to the front of the bridge. Newcomers get to go first at this part, your lordship. Kaladin dumbly picked up the bridge with the others, raising it over his head. The handholds were the same here, but this front row had a notched opening before his face, allowing him to see out. All of the bridgemen had changed positions. The men who had been running in the front moved to the back, and those at the back, including Kaladin and the leathery-faced bridgeman, moved to the front. Kaladin didn't ask the point of it. He didn't care. He liked the front, though. Jogging was easier now that he could see ahead of him. The landscape on the plateaus was that of rough stormlands. There were scattered patches of grass, but the stone here was too hard for their seeds to fully burrow into. Rock buds were more common, growing like bubbles across the entire plateau, imitating rocks about the size of a man's head. Many of the buds were split, trailing out their vines like thick green tongues. A few were even in bloom. After so many hours breathing in the stuffy confines beneath the bridge, running in the front was almost relaxing. Why had they given such a wonderful position to a newcomer? To little Adi Lin, bearer of all agonies. It's going to be a bad one. They're already lined up. It's going to be a bad one. Kaladin blinked, focusing on the approaching chasm. On the other side of the rift stood a rank of men with marbled crimson and black skin. They were wearing a strange rusty orange armor that covered their forearms, chests, heads and legs. It took his numbed mind a moment to understand. The Parshendi. They weren't like common Parshman workers. They were far more muscular, far more solid. They had the bulky build of soldiers and each one carried a weapon strapped to his back. Some were dark red and black beards tied with bits of rock, while others were clean shaven. As Kaladin watched, the front row of Parshendi knelt down. They held short bows, arrows knocked. Not long bows intended to launch arrows high and far. Short, recurve bows to fire straight and quick and strong. An excellent bow to use for killing a group of bridgemen before they could lay their bridge. Arriving is the worst part. Now, finally, the real nightmare began. Keep moving! Kaladin's instinct screamed at him to get out of the line of fire, but the momentum of the bridge forced him forward, forced him down the throat of the beast itself, its teeth poised to snap closed. Kaladin's exhaustion and pain fled. He was shocked alert. The bridges charged forward. The archers released. The first wave killed Kaladin's leathery-faced friend, dropping him with three separate arrows. The bridge got noticeably heavier as men died. The Parshendi calmly drew a second volley and launched. To the side, Kaladin barely noticed another of the bridge crews floundering. The Parshendi seemed to focus their fire on certain crews. That one got a full wave of arrows from dozens of archers, and the first three rows of bridgemen dropped and tripped those behind them. Their bridge lurched, skidding on the ground. Arrows zipped past Kaladin, killing the other two men in the front line with him. Several other arrows smacked into the wood around him, one slicing over the skin of his cheek. Never before had he felt so powerless in battle. He'd charged enemy fortifications, he'd run beneath waves of arrows, but he'd always felt a measure of control. He'd had his spear, he'd had his shield, he could fight back. Not this time. The bridge crews were like hogs running to the slaughter. A third volley flew, and another of the twenty bridge crews fell. Waves of arrows came from the Alethi side as well, falling and striking the Parshendi. Kaladin's bridge was almost to the chasm. He could see the black eyes of the Parshendi on the other side, could make out the features of their lean, marbled faces. All around him, bridgemen were falling, arrows cutting them out from underneath their bridges. Another bridge went down. Lift and down, you fool! The bridge crew lurched to a stop as the Parshendi launched another volley. The Parshendi firing was interrupted by a return volley from the Alethi army. 
Though he was shocked senseless, Kaladin's reflexes knew what to do. Drop the bridge, get into position to push. This exposed the bridgemen who had been safe in the back ranks. The Parshendi archers obviously knew this was coming. They prepared and launched one final volley. Arrows struck the bridge in a wave, dropping a half dozen men, spraying blood across the dark wood. Fearspren, wiggly and violet, sprang up through the wood and wiggled in the air. The bridge lurched, growing much harder to push as they suddenly lost those men. Kaladin stumbled, hands slipping. He fell to his knees and pitched out, leaning over the chasm. He barely managed to catch himself. He teetered, one hand dangling above the void, the other gripping the edge. His overextended mind wavered with vertigo as he stared down that sheer cliff, down into the darkness. The height was beautiful. He'd always loved climbing high rock formations with Tien. By reflex, he shoved himself back onto the plateau, scrambling backward. A group of foot soldiers, protected by shields, had taken up positions pushing the bridge. The army's archers exchanged arrows with the Parshendi as the soldiers pushed the bridge into place and heavy cavalry thundered across, smashing into the Parshendi. Four bridges had fallen, but 16 had been placed in a row, allowing for an effective charge. Kaladin tried to move, tried to crawl away from the bridge. But he just collapsed where he was, his body refusing to obey. He couldn't even roll over onto his stomach. I should go. See if that leathery-faced man is still alive. Find his wounds. Save. But he couldn't. He couldn't move. Couldn't think. To his shame, he just let himself close his eyes and gave himself over to unconsciousness. Oh.